Thank you very much, Professor. <clears throat> Well, that brings us more or less up to today, but not quite, because Gracia will now tell us the, what we have learned from the Planck satellite. Gracia, over to you. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here giving this talk today at STEC about the contribution of Planck uh, to cosmology. So for almost 15 years, 50 years, the cosmic micro background radiation has been one of the most important sources of information about our universe at large. Let me start by reviewing what we have learned so far. First of all, the universe used to be hot and denser. Therefore, there is, because you know that there is no, uh, currently, no uh, credible alternative to the Big Bang. On the other hand, very early on, it is plausible that the universe expanded really fast for a very short period of time. Something like inflation happened. We also have learned that there is lots of invisible matter, what we call the dark matter, and so on. Thank you. So we've heard today uh, Malcolm talk about the pivotal role of precision for advancements in science in general, and for the advancements in the understanding of the universe in particular, what we are interested in here at this moment in time. And in particular, to understand the properties and constituents of this universe. Now, Planck offered, or is offering us, exactly that, precision. And because we are talking about Planck, I'm showing here an image of the Planck uh, satellite. It is the Planck is the third generation of CMB space mission following uh, COBE, launched in 1989, WMAP, launched in 2001, and Planck itself was launched in 2009. It was designed to measure with unprecedented precision and, uh, and resolution the ancient light, the oldest light in the universe, the cosmic micro background. And that's exactly what it has done. superb image of the CMB. This is exactly what I've been waiting for most of my career. It is, without any shadow of, light, of, of doubt, the, the sharpest and clearest image of this ancient light. However, however, to get that image, we have to go through a very meticulous process. First of all, Planck doesn't see that map. What Planck really sees is the sky in mostly nine wavelengths. That's, these are beautiful maps, as you can see here. And each of each is given at independent frequencies and is contributed by different foregrounds. These foregrounds have to be removed in order to unveil the relic radiation. And we can do that. And how do we do that? First of all, each of these radiation from our own galaxy and other galaxies and CMB have different spectra, which means that they depend, they vary differently from one wavelength to another. And that's why we can separate them. On the other hand, Planck has, uh, covers a wide range of wavelengths that allows us to uh, separate them extremely well and recover the true CMB light with high quality. This is why and how Planck unveils the cosmic micro background radiation. Let me now show you a little cartoon, a movie, just to illustrate how we do it. First of all, you see a map with, oh, it's okay, <laughs> we isolate individual sources, looks like that. Then you go to the next component where you isolate the radio emission from Milky Way. This is what it looks like. We peel it off. Next, we look at the emission from dust particles of the Milky Way. This is what it looks like. We peel it off. And this is what's left behind, the super CMB map provided by Planck. This is indeed the crown jewels of our project. As we heard from Bruce beforehand, uh, this map contains a wealth of information. 
And because the most angular scales, one part of the sky looks like another, we can actually compute and work out the average of the noise power at different angular scales. This is what, in technical terms, we refer to as the power spectrum. Power spectrum is an important tool for us to infer what we have inferred with Planck about the universe. Let me explain a few concepts just now. Look at the top map. The top map is just uh, uh, extracted from the full sky CMB map. That you see a superposition of fluctuations in different angular scales. On the bottom in the right hand side, what you see is in the yellow curve is the angular power spectra of that map. Now what I'm going to show next is I'm going to slide this pink filter and this pink filter is basically a filter of the angular scales of the fluctuations that we'll see in the left hand side map. Let me move it and, <coughs> sorry, and slide this filter from left to right, from large angular scales to smaller angular scales. You see the fluctuations of the particular size. Note the peaks orange and the throws blue. Uh, blue. Let's move slide again, and now we are on the top of the first peak. You see that the fluctuations now are smaller in size at the degree scales. And note that the peaks now are red. They are more intense, it's brighter. Let's move beyond the first peak. The fluctuations now are even smaller, but they are fainter. And now if you go to towards the arc minute scale, say, you almost see uh, nothing. So basically what the angular power spectrum is telling us about is how the amplitude of these fluctuations varies with size. And just from the structure of this power spectrum, we infer a wealth of information in the universe, as Bruce was telling beforehand. First of all, for instance, just from the amplitude of these peaks, we can infer the matter content in the universe. From the relative ratios of the peaks, even and odd peaks, we can infer the uh, content in terms of the ordinary matter. You know, the stuff that stars, you and I are made of. Made of. For instance, just from the position first, first peak, we can have some sort of information about the geometry of the universe, and so on. So let me now next show you the power spectrum from Planck. Here you see the data in red dots and the uncertainties with arrow bars. And you can see that this power spectrum encompasses a quite wide range of angular scales, from degree angular scales to arc minutes. Now next, left hand side of this plot, we reach, <coughs> we reach the, the limit of precision. And believe me, one cannot do better than this. However, the right hand side of this plot is a regime that's mostly limited by the noise in the instrument. <coughs> and the error bars that you see, actually, the error bars that you do not see, because they are very small. They are at most of the size of the dots that represent our data points. And this is only possible because the level of noise in Planck maps is very low. This is precision cosmology. Now, what we do, we compare the, our data set, our data points from Planck, Planck data, we compare to a plethora of models. And the remarkable thing is that we find a match. But even more remarkable is that this match is well described by six key cosmological parameters that essentially fits perfectly our data points. And this model here is given by the, blue, the, the green curve. And you can see that the green curve goes through essentially almost all data points. Now let me trans translate that curve into something more quantitative. Let me translate a curve into numbers. These numbers are the cosmological parameters that describe the universe. For instance, on the left hand side, you see a pi representing the constituents of the universe. We see the amount of ordinary matter, regular matter, the amount of dark matter. And then, of course, we've, we've heard before, the, the, we talk about dark matter and about the ordinary matter, but we have not yet even mentioned dark energy. So dark energy is this huge amount of one of the constituents of the universe, one of the mysterious constituents of the universe, that we don't know what is or what might be. In any case, it's the majority of the content of our universe, in this case, 68.3%. And it's actually important to have it in order to have a consistency or to have, if you want, a special flatness of the universe. And in fact, Planck is consistent to the special flatness to a level of a percent level. 
I'm not going to define what parameters are and uh, displayed on the right hand side. What I think is impressive, and I hope you can convince you, is the error bars in the measurements. If you look at the error bars, they are really very small and much smaller than the measurements. And in fact, our measurements are at percent and sub percent level. Once again, this is precision cosmology. So what have you learned so far with Planck? First of all, the universe seems to be well described by a simple model, meaning that is well defined or described by six key cosmological parameters. And what we've learned is that the universe is different from what we thought. It's a little bit older, it is expanding a little more slowly, and has more matter and less dark energy. One of our surprises in our data is that we measured the expansion of the universe, uh, the rate of expansion of the universe, which is given by the parameter, the, the Hubble constant parameter, H0. And what we found is that this value is actually surprisingly uh, um, you know, smaller than previous experiments, previous measurements. And in particular, it seems to be in slight <laughs> tension with other measurements of the same uh, quantity from independent cosmological probes. This is very interesting, and this is giving rise to very fruitful discussions already in the scientific community as I speak. Now, we also, of course, investigated beyond the six, cosmolo the six cosmological parameters. And one of the things that we found, and I'm listed here a few, and not uh, by any means is a is, is com complete or comprehensive list. First of all, we find that there is no evidence for a time-varying dark energy so far. On the other hand, we find that there is no evidence for um, a new types of ultraparticles such as neutrinos. The number of effective neutrinos is three. We also set very stringent uh, upper limits on the neutrino mass. This is one way where the CMB studies are very much intimately connected to fundamental physics, one of the examples. On the other hand, we know that most of theories that try uh, or attempt to explain or attempt to find uh, a way of unifying the forces of nature usually predict that fundamental constants will vary in time. What we find here is that we don't, we don't find any evidence that they do vary. In fact, for instance, we've, uh, and I give just an example of fine structure constant here. And I'm saying that they don't vary at redshift of a thousand when the universe was 380,000 years old. We don't have evidence yet for primordial gravitational waves. We still have an upper limit. And another very interesting, surprising, and interesting uh, result is that fluctuations, uh, the fluctuations in CMB are very random. However, as perfect it might be, it's not the whole story. And in fact, we see deviations from this otherwise perfect picture. First of all, this simple model that I've been uh, talking about does not fit well the data for very large angular scales. On the other hand, the Planck maps show and exhibit features or anomalies that do not fit and not explained very well by this simple model. First of all, the cold spot. And if I could I'll tell you where it is, but he's basically on that side, <laughs> the other side, and the bottom, and the blue dot that side there. And what happens is that there is a cold spot that is as an extension larger than expected from the standard model. Another one is the hemispherical symmetry, meaning that light patterns are asymmetric only two halves of the sky. Let me look at this last one in a bit more of detail. So in this sense, what I'm saying is that the two halves of the sky that we see look different. Look at these two hemispheres, it's left and right hand side. In topographic terms, I could say that on the left hemisphere sky, the peaks of the mountains are higher and the seas are deeper. This feature has been noticed before and deemed controversial. It's now proven real by Planck. Does this call for new physics? One thing to note here, though, is that these are large scale features, and therefore they give us a pristine image of the universe when it was very, 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 very young. And notice that these sort of asymmetries are not very well explained and do not fit the standard model. So now, 
that I gave you a bit of a view, an overview, and as I say, by far, it's not comprehensive and complete. Let's ask the question, what's next? So Planck data is a jewel box filled with treasures. We learned a great deal about the universe. And even if to get to this point it was very, very exhausting and very tiring, as Bruce was hinting at early on, and I'm sure that many of the Planck team members around here would uh, contribute to this, uh, this statement very clearly. Um, however, there is still uh, quite a great deal amount of work to do and to learn. There is still data to analyze and work to do, and particularly including the polarization of these ancient lights. Now, I'm going just to say this, because I think it's important. It has taken us 20 years to get to this point. One might ponder what our knowledge of the universe will be in 20 years. Time. Thank you, Rasa. Thank you very much, Gus. Thank, Thank you very much, Bruce. That is now the easy part of the evening. Oh, now I have got to uh, try to coordinate uh, the questions that uh, you may have about the presentations we've heard. And uh, remember, this is for members of the public. If I spot any member of the flight team asking a question, I shall hold up a red card. <laughs> that, that, that is not that. So we must concentrate on the questions that uh, the, the people uh, who the taxpayers who give their money, the questions they want to know about that project. So can I ask if there are any questions of, uh, now from any members of the public that you wish to ask? Push the button on your microphone. Did you hear everything I said? Yes. Good, good, yes. Can I, can I, I ask for questions? Yes. Good evening. Oh, is it working? Yep. Um, yes, OK, I have a question, uh, hopefully not uh, too controversial. Um, you, have, you have mentioned the uh, uh, dark matter, uh, dark energy. Uh, you. Um, so you, you remember the old times, Tycho Bray and the other one, and mentioning the ether, that's a, that's a, that's a very uh, good anchoring point. Uh, and in this whole time, the, the, the people had to invent the ether uh, to, uh, to uh, understand how these stars could hang up in the sky, okay? So they, they had to invent this reality uh, to make it working with their mind, yeah? Uh, later on, okay, Newton, uh, came with the theory of the very good progress. Uh, uh, was gone. Uh, then relativity came in, general relativity with uh, Einstein. And, and what was nice is that the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, Einstein uh, did not destroy in the, the Newton theory. It just embedded it you know, in something more general. Now, here's my question. Why do we have to go back to inventing some matter dark matter or dark energy uh, in, in order to try to match with the uh, current models that we are using in general relativity of uh, Einstein. Why don't we um, think that maybe this is time to further expand uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the theory uh, rather than trying to invent some matter as we did with Heather? Thank you very much. That's a very, a very good question. Um, uh, do either of you wish to answer it, or shall I answer it? <laughs> this is the role of chairman, to pick up all really difficult questions. Your, your question is a very good one. Uh, and it is being, of course, addressed by many, many theorists who are trying to find ways of doing this. There are various ideas in the literature where you could indeed uh, modify gravity in various ways to try to, to, try to make it work. I think I think uh, most of us working in the field uh, believe that in the, the case for dark matter is really rather compelling. Uh, and uh, likewise, the dark kind of the acceleration of the universe is not just coming from one experiment, it's coming from a number of experiments. So we believe that our theories have to do that. But where the interest comes in is that can we build general relativity into the more fundamental theories so that we've got some grand unified theory, the various things 
that will be, have been talked about, things that we cannot yet test. And yet there might be the relics of some of these early phenomena lying in the map. We just cannot answer your question at the moment. But we are working very, very hard. Is that an adequate answer, do you think? Yes. Uh, we've got so many experts in the audience that uh, is anyone going to disagree with my assessment? Thank you. Nobody is. Uh, can we go for another question from the audience? Uh, there being a little pause while you get your question, I've got another set of questions which have come uh, from, the, from the public. Uh, Bruce, would you like to address the question, uh, is Planck seeing further back in time than the Large Hadron Collider? To which the correct answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, let me start with the no. I, I was at pains to point out that we do see a particular time in the history of the universe, 370,000 years after the Big Bang. The temperature then was a, a, of the order of 3,000 Kelvin, which is far lower in energy, energy than anything the Large Hadron Collider is looking at. So in a sense, the answer is no. But in another sense, the answer is yes, because imprinted in the fluctuations that you see in the Planck map is information about the universe at a time more like 10 to the minus 30 seconds, when the energy density and the typical temperature were far higher than anything that could be seen in the Large Hadron Collider. Hence, yes and no. Thank you very much, Bruce. Now we've got our first tweet question coming in from the general public, uh, which came in, which are kindly been provided by Rodrigo. Um, Grasa, here's the question. Anomalies aligned with the ecliptic plane. Are these statistically significant? Is the cause local or global? <laughs> Quite a question. Um, <laughs> Um, first of all, I should say that um, it is actually not aligned with the ecliptic plane. That's the first thing to say. And uh, the second thing is the, the statistical significance is, is, um, is not high. Uh, if it's local or global. Okay, first thing to understand is that this same, if this same effect is observed both on the frequency maps of Planck as well as the maps that have been cleaned from foregrounds by many different methods. And all of these methods have different residuals in their maps. Nonetheless, they still see the same effect. They still see this um, asymmetry between the two hemispheres. So this seems to indicate that's not related to that. Uh, secondly, there is an indication that, for instance, the current uh, indication from the uh, high frequency uh, um, uh, high frequencies that the zodiacal light has, uh, well, uh, is symmetric with regards to the ecliptic plane. So, if it was really local or related to the solar system, then we should see that at that level as well. Uh, I think I'll leave from cool. here. Question. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's uh, very helpful. Uh, is, is there another question from the audience here present? Don't be modest. Yes, do. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was wondering, you're now looking at the, the galaxy when it was three, um, 300,000 years old, right? Um, why this age? Um, or why does it come from? Why not yeah. earlier or, or later? And would it change the model or something? I'd, I'd love to explain that. <laughs> and there's a perfect analogy outside, clouds. Think for a moment about what happens when you look at a cloud or you paint the surface of a cloud. Light is scattering off the droplets of water in the cloud. When it reaches the edge of the cloud, it stops scattering and is then free to travel in a straight line to the waiting receptacle, your eye. Exactly the same thing is true for the microwave background. When the temperature in the early universe was higher than about 3,000 Kelvin, the material of the universe was ionized, so there were lots of free electrons. And those free electrons are strong scatterers of light. So until the temperature dropped below 3,000 Kelvin, the photons were bouncing around. Suddenly, technical term, Saha equation, suddenly the universe became unionized, recombined, 
and the scattering stopped and the photons were free to travel. Since we know the physics, we can predict when that occurred and the answer is now 370,000 years. So you see that surface in the same way you see a Dutch cloud. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rob. Um, we've got another question here, which uh, maybe Grasse, uh, this is another uh, tweet that came in, came in recently. Grasse, um, here's your question. When might we see the release of polarization data coming from the early universe? What chance do you give of Planck discovering the B modes? Tomorrow. <laughs> 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 no, of course, I'm joking. Um, well, we expect to release polarized data within about a year. Uh, talking about the, the probability of discovering B-modes, this is, of course, very much dependent on the predictions. You know, we don't have a clear idea uh, to what's the level of B-modes that we should expect to see, first of all. Um, secondly, uh, I should say that Planck was designed mostly to measure temperature fluctuations. It was not uh, designed as a polarimeter to start with. But in fact, we are actually, actually Planck uh, is doing a quite real uh, good job of uh, providing us sufficient data to actually, you know, polarize data to actually analyze. So we need to wait and see. Stay tuned. That's all I can say. <laughs> May I add something to that? Yeah. Malcolm and I have a small bet on whether <laughs> Planck will reveal any evidence for B modes. It's a bottle of good Scotch whiskey against a bottle of Pennsylvania wine. <laughs> <laughs> We're not telling. <laughs> can I have? Well, I, I think I, I think there's a chance. Bruce, can I? I, I, have... I say Sorry. we need the next mission. I don't think we'll do it. But again, you know, how boring it would be if we did get it without another mission. But that's that's my prejudice. <laughs> but, uh, shall I shall I bet a, a bottle of port wine? Yes. <laughs> Which way? Which, Which way? way? Oh. <laughs> I have to decide. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you later on. <laughs> you you get, you give two bottles of port, whichever one of us is right. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good solution. Uh, Bruce, can I try this with this one on you? Uh, here's another question from from. The tweet which says, are there any indications of bruising from other universes multiverse bubble theory on the CMB? Not as far as we know. I think that's the right answer. Uh, the, the, the suggestion here is that the observable universe is just a small part of a much larger structure. Other parts of that structure may have different physics. And the question is whether information can leak from those other structures into our universe in some way affecting the CMB. Uh, there's no, in, in my view, there's no current evidence for that. And that may simply be that our piece of the multi-universe is much larger than the portion of the universe which we can now see in the CMB. After all, there is a limit. We can only see out the age of the universe times the speed of light. Maybe that's not far enough to see the effect of other universes on ours. Thank you very much. Now, more questions from, from the audience. I might slightly relax my stringent rules and say if an astronomer really wanted to ask a question, we could do it, but only if you feel very bold. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. The dark energy is needed for the late time expansion of the universe. But if you look at the late time part of the universe, it's also not as homogeneous as the picture of the, th that you showed. So what would happen if you would interpret your results in terms of a slightly inhomogeneous inho universe at late time? That's a, very, uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, shall I have a go at answering it? Yeah, I shall give you my, now there's so many experts in the audience that uh, I, I, I've got support, right. I hope. Right. The, the point is that the dark 
energy, the lambda term, only begins to take effect on the very, very largest scale. It has got negligible local effects. And that's just because it is, it, it's just there. It doesn't change like the density of matter. It's just there all the time because of the way that the equation of state works, which we've demonstrated is, as far as we know, this, this negative pressure equation of state. So what it means is that although the universe is on an inhomogeneous, the things which is driving the exponential expansion is actually operating on the very largest scales. And to a good approximation, we, can, we know that the amplitude of the power spectrum is decreasing very rapidly when we get up to these very, very large scales. So I think the answer is that despite your question is a very good one. And if we had ultra-sensitive experiments, we might be able to see the effects of the lambda term on more smaller scales. But it would be very, 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 very difficult. Now, that, that is, that is, that is my, my, my current view. That is why, if you look at something like the Euclid project, it's an extremely difficult project even to begin to see, ask a simple question about whether the lambda term, if it is lambda term or dark energy, has actually changed significantly with cosmic epoch. Just because because it only begins to make its impact on the very, very large scales. Now, I don't know if any of the experts in the audience would wish to give a better answer than, well, you can give a better answer, but probably not a simpler one than I've given. Uh, the, would any of the experts wish to contribute? That means I've got a degree of authority. Thank you very much. Now, uh, can, we, uh, can we take any other questions from the audience? There, there, there are others coming up. Um. Thank you very much. Good. good. <clears throat> Um, here's, uh, this is one for you, Grasser, which I, I think you can dispose of uh, quite well. The coldest spot in the universe again. Tell us how cold. Very cold, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, it's cold. It's not that cold. What is important about the, <laughs> the cold spot is that it's a large area of the sky with that being cold, okay, which is not expected from the standard model. You don't expect to have a coherent temperature in that sort of angular scales. Okay, this is the problem mostly. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. It, the answer is it's tiny. Yeah. It, is, it, it is one part in 10 to the 5 away from the surrounding temperature. So it is, um, it is the coldest spot, but by an infinitesimal amount. Is that fair? That's fair. Mm, that, okay. that, 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 that's right. Um, th are there other questions from the audience now? Can we take more? Yes. My brother asked me the following question the other day, and as an ESA staff member, I was not able to reply. He we said, can't hear. So, sorry. Can you hear? No. Can uh, okay. you try no, again? No. Yes, right. that's yes. good, yes. The question is, if light has taken all these years from the Big Bang to come to us, it means we arrived here before the light. So how come? Have we been traveling faster than light? Okay. Uh, Bruce has kindly agreed to answer this question. <laughs> no. I, I kindly agreed to have a shot at answering the question. I think it may stem from a misunderstanding about the expansion of the universe. The, the picture I think you have in mind is a sort of explosive beginning from some point. And in that picture, we had to rush out ahead of the light which is now catching up with us. This is what I call a hand grenade picture of the Big Bang. Bang, and fragments fly out. A much better picture, and one that's appropriate to where we are, is the notion of a flower unfolding. The whole of space is expanding, carrying matter with it. So it's not a question of us moving through space at the speed of light. It's simply that we sit still in space and the space expands. In that picture, it's, it's, it's much clearer that the light can gradually catch up to us in this expanding space. It isn't that we have to rush out someplace to get there ahead of the light. Thank you. Let me give you my version that I use in my public lectures, uh, which is that 
and this is where Planck comes in. You, to develop the models of the universe that we use, we need only two things. We need the expansion, the local measured expansion, and we need the isotropy. And if you put these two things together, that tells us that the universe as a whole, and not just us in our position, see an expanding universe. So I show an ex in my lectures a picture of this happening, and I ask the audience, does this mean that we are at the center of the universe? And the answer is yes. <laughs> but so is everybody else. The way the models are constructed, everyone is sitting at the center of the universe, and all of them see the same average expansion at the same time. And that's the trick in making the models work. And it's why we're able to do cosmology at all. It's thanks to this isotropy and homogeneity and the expansion that are fantastic gifts that enable us to ask all of these very, very detailed and, and, and wonderful questions. Do you want to have a go to? No? no? Okay. <laughs> uh, can we take another question from the audience? Yes. Uh, I will add for your brother that part of us, what we thought is like was emitted. The hydrogen that is in our body was partly formed before. Yes. So it's also important that it's not only about light, it's also about particles that give a very strong constraint about uh, the Big Bang. How much time do we have? Right. Uh, can we take... There was, a there was a question over there. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, actually, two questions. Uh, we know from previous uh, observations that obviously the universe is uh, uh, homogeneous in the large scale, but we know that there are some uh, anomalies like uh, big voids for extent that extends for millions of uh, light years and things like dark flow. So my question is, uh, will has Planck already asked those, qu help uh, understand the, the, those anomalies, or will next few years help to understand those? Uh, so could you just, the, the problem you had, could you just identify it more precisely? We know that from previous observations uh, from WMAP or other, other experiments that there are some big voids in the universe, yes. and yes. as well some anomalies like dark flow. Yes. So my question is, will, will Planck, Planck's results help to understand those? The second question is, what are, for the next few years, what are the big questions we, we, we the, the biggest questions we are, we are hoping to get through, got some better understanding Good. on? Good. Good. We will, we will answer that. I will answer the first one, and my colleagues will answer the second one. So I will do the voids, and you have time. You've got half a minute to think of the answer of what we do next, OK? So the, the answer to the voids is very, very beautiful. And that is that you know, the huge voids that we see on scales of, say, 100 megaparsec, they are simply driven by the attractive force of gravity. That as soon as any of these per perturbations grow into the nonlinear regime, then they will collapse along their shortest axis. I was there in Moscow with Rashid and my colleagues when I saw the beautiful work of the Zeldovich solutions, and I said, my goodness, that's incredible. What it's telling you is that you collapse most rapidly along the shortest axis. And that happening on the large scales, on the large scale perturbations, can account for the big voids. But what we cannot do is to understand where these initial seeds came, because they were on super horizon scales. And that's one of the strong motivations for taking very seriously the idea that something like the inflationary picture enabled regions of the universe which could not possibly have been have the same properties of the present day did in fact have the same properties because they were in causal connection to the early universe so the uh, actually, the, what I'm saying is there's a very good explanation of these in the standard model of the picture which builds in the inflation concept so having given you one minute to think about the next big things, Grasa, what's your answer? Well, what's regarding Planck, of course, we need to, to understand the anomalies, start with. That's one of the things that should be, and we will investigate. Another is, for instance, the tensions that have been um, uh, observed with regards to the Hubble constant value as determined by Planck. Uh, of course, we are all looking for B modes and polarization, a particular detection of these B modes and polarization of the, of the micro background radiation. Um, I think I'll pass to Bruce now to complete this. <laughs> yeah. 
I'd agree with everything you say. Uh, the next thing that's coming from Planck, and it's very important, are measurements of polarization. Uh, in a sense, as Grasso has already pointed out, Planck has done the temperature spectrum about as well as you can do it, at least at relatively large angular scales. At small angular scales of arc minutes, there's still a good deal of work to be done from the ground. But what hasn't been closed as a subject is polarization. And Planck, although it was not initially designed to do a terrific job with polarization, is in fact doing a terrific job with polarization. And we'll see the benefits coming from that. Polarization then implies fairly directly improved limits on the scalar tensor ratio, which tells you about inflation. The Planck value is already very good, but it can be pushed down once polarization comes in. So that connection to polarization, understanding polarized systematics, perhaps getting the so-called B modes to be technical for a moment is very important. And then I would reemphasize something that Grasse said. Planck has arrived explosively uh, 10 days ago with all kinds of new cosmological results. And in some places, there are tensions with observations from different branches of astronomy, or even, for that matter, within the, the cosmic microwave background community. And we need to get those sorted out. We've just barely got started. Remember that the public release was on the 21st of March, which is less than two weeks ago. Thank you very much, Bruce. Well, of course, everyone, all the professionals in this room are thinking about their next project and their next but one project. In this game, you've got to be very far, looking very far into the future, because we must make sure we've got the technologies available to do the key things that we really, really want to do. Um, I, I, I'm looking at Jan. Uh, shall we take one or two more questions? Yeah. And then, we, and then we'll have to, have to close. So it's getting close to the last time that you will have the chance to ask the question you always wanted to ask about cosmology. So let me encourage you to, for, for a couple more questions. Yes. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the link between what we see with your observation and the visible universe as we know it? There is somehow, for me, a big gap here. Oh, uh, this is such a wonderful question. And it, it, it really, uh, I shall ask both Grass and, and, uh, and Bruce to answer this as well. But it, it is painfully beautiful. And I use the word beautiful. This picture, the picture that we are seeing from that. Because it is linking the way in which we know physics tells us that things have to develop into the structures that we see in the universe now. So it is all being driven by gravity. And on top of that, we've got to put in these, these components, the dark matter, the dark energy. But that whole picture is holding together remarkably beautiful. You've got to think of gravitational collapse as being the thing which then makes the galaxies. Then within these, it makes the stars. And then further gravitational collapse makes our solar systems. So the pictures that we see all come out of the seeds that are imprinted on the microwave background radiation. Uh, Grasa. You, uh, Remember that the seeds we see, the faint regions of, of higher and lower density, are not the seeds of the galaxies, literally, that we see. They're seeds of different galaxies. Uh, that is, you can't say that that particular region of the CMB is going to grow into M31, the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, however, given the argument of statistical homogeneity in the universe, those seeds or seeds like them had to produce the structure we see much more locally around us and do solely by the action of gravity, which I think is a remarkable, remarkable result. You don't need anything more than gravity to get the process started. Thank you very much. Now, the last question. Yes. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, so I understand we received the, the CMB from the last scattering surface. And I also understand uh, that this last scattering surface will be different tomorrow, because we continuously receive a light from a receding surface. So my question is, how much time do we have to wait 
to redo Planck and to have a significant different picture. Uh, who, who wants to tackle ta 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 um, right, okay, I am your chairman. I take full responsibility for my, for my answer to, the, to, to this one. Um, we are, of course, looking at, at a surface in, in, uh, which is always redshifted. As, as we go forward in time, of course, it will go to larger and larger redshifts because the universe will be getting old. So we will gradually see it getting fainter and fainter. So we'd better do the experiments now uh, <laughs> before the fluctuations disappear into excessively large redshift space. So don't let us wait for another 20 billion years to repeat the experiment. That, that would be our caution. The thing is, it, it, it is this beautiful stuff. It's like looking, Bruce gave the analogy of looking at a cloud. I always say it's like looking at the surface of the sun because it is the same sort of photosphere. It's roughly at the same temperature. And you cannot see inside the sun. You simply have to infer what's happening in the sun uh, in the optical wave band of what you see. And it's the same happening. But now you've got to think of that getting colder and colder. So let's get on with the cosmology now. Well, I think we will draw that to a conclusion now. And can I thank everyone? Well, of course, we've got to thank all of the many, many players who have actually made this whole fantastic project. You know, I never thought when I started to do cosmology that I would be sitting here today and looking at these. It is painfully beautiful and emotionally moving that we can actually do things together internationally to produce this pure beauty of science. So we thank all the agencies for making that possible. I thank especially Grasa and Bruce for fielding all of these uh, tricky, difficult, stretching questions. And of course, thank you to all the teams which have been making this possible. So thank you very much. Thank you.